and now it's 6 p.m. So let's get started. Good evening once again and welcome. The Chester Running Center in partnership with Augustana Campus and the Faculty of Arts are pleased to present tonight's event. The power of the pen, the petitions of Thomas Peters and the quest for black rights in Canada and the Atlantic world with distinguished visiting scholar, Dr. Afwa Cooper. The University of Alberta has multiple campuses on 36 territory, each of which sit on land that are territory, traditional territories to various indigenous groups. As tonight's event is in partnership between areas on different campuses, we have made sure to acknowledge these groups on your screen. The University of Alberta respects the sovereignty, lives, histories, languages, knowledge system and cultures of First Nations, Métis and Inuit nations. Their spiritual and practical relationships with the land create a rich heritage for our learning and our life as our community. My name is James Kariuki. I'm a professor of chemistry and also the associate dean teaching at the Augustana campus. In addition to my teaching and administrative duties, I'm involved in several initiatives that are geared towards helping black youth attain their educational goals. These include the Black Youth Mentorship and Leadership Program and the experiential learning in innovation, technology and entrepreneurship program for black youth. Tonight's presentation is about 40 minutes in length, followed by a question period. We will be collecting questions throughout the presentation. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions at any time. At the end of the presentation, these questions will be shared with our presenter to address. Today's event is part of Black History Month at the University of Alberta. Black History Month is a time for us to come together as a community to honor the contributions, achievements, and lived experiences of Black Canadians and newcomers to Canada. Before I introduce our moderator this evening, I would like to welcome President Flanagan to bring greetings on behalf of the University of Alberta. President Flanagan joined the U of A in 2020 from Queen's University, where he served as Dean of the Faculty of Law from 2005 to 2019. Welcome, President Flanagan. Hello, everyone, and thank you, James. I'm really delighted to be here this evening and joining you in this event, uh, organized by the Chester Ronning Center, Augustana Campus, and the Faculty of Arts. And this is a cross-faculty partnership, and it's really a wonderful opportunity to connect with colleagues, friends, and alumni from across the university. And I'm really excited to hear from celebrated speaker, scholar, and historian, Dr. Afua Cooper. Her talk is one of several events taking place across our campuses as part of Black History Month. And at the University of Alberta, we are enormously proud to celebrate the many accomplishments of Black Canadians. And this month is also an opportunity to uncover, explore, and seek solutions to some of the historical barriers that Black Canadians continue to face. I think it's also important to acknowledge that Black students, scholars, and staff at the University of Alberta have also faced their own barriers. And I'm proud to say that we've made some important progress in the past year to identify and address some of those barriers. In November, I was very proud to sign the Scarborough Charter on Anti-Black Racism and Black Inclusion in Canadian Higher Education. This is a pledge by more than 40 universities and colleges to address structural racism by increasing Black diversity and inclusivity. It complements our own strategic plan for equity, diversity, and inclusivity, which calls on us to make meaningful efforts to build an inclusive process for all. And we are making important progress on several other fronts as well. In December, we, are, we committed to hiring up to 11 tenure-track Black scholars from across the University of Alberta. 
Uh, both Augustana campus and the Faculty of Arts will welcome a new assistant professor as part of this initiative. And all of the positions are now posted, and we hope to welcome these new colleagues in July. And to build inclusive campuses for our Black students, we need to start by better understanding their experiences. Late last year, we launched our first ever student demographics diversity census. We're still gathering the results, but once we do and share them, of course, with the university community, we will be in a better position to identify and improve student supports and promote an equitable, diverse and inclusive culture on all of our campuses. These initiatives follow key conversations that I've had with black student and faculty groups at the University of Alberta. And I truly appreciate their leadership and their commitment to open dialogue to ensure that we are addressing anti-Black racism and advancing our commitment to inclusivity. So I hope you'll, you will enjoy tonight's talk by Dr. Cooper about how Black Canadian, the Black Canadians of Atlantic Canada fought for their rights. I have no doubt that tonight's presentation will inspire important conversations and challenge all of us to think about what we can do more to build an inclusive, equitable, and diverse society. So thank you again for joining you, joining us. I look forward to meeting you all again, I hope in person sometime soon. And with that, I'll pass it on back to you, James. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, President Flanagan, for your remarks. I would now like to introduce our moderator this evening, Shelley Ann Tate. Shelley is a professor and Canada Research Chair Tier 1 in feminism and intersectionality. She is from the sociology department at the University of Alberta. Her area of research is Black Diaspora Studies broadly, and her research interests are institutional racism, the body, affect, beauty, hybridity, race performativity, and Caribbean decolonial studies while paying attention to the intersection of race and gender. Shelley? Thank you so much, James. Hello everyone and welcome. I'm delighted to be welcoming distinguished visiting scholar, Dr. Afua Cooper this evening. Afua Cooper is a multidisciplinary scholar, author and artist. Her 13 books raise across, range across such genres as history, poetry, fiction and children's literature. Her outstanding research on enslavement and black history has made her one of the leading figures in African Canadian studies and the foremost authority on Canadian enslavement. Her book on Canadian slavery, The Hanging of Angelique, the untold story of slavery in Canada and the burning of old Montreal, broke new ground in the study of Canadian and Atlantic slavery. Afua Cooper currently teaches in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Dalhousie University, where she holds a Killam Research Chair. Welcome, Dr. Cooper, to our virtual stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tate. I think you need to see my face, yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Kiriuki and uh, President Flanagan, um, to Kim Weeb, to uh, Demetrius, who first made the contact from Augustana campus. I thank all of you and to all the members of the audience um, for this wonderful invitation and giving me the opportunity to present this work on Thomas Peters. It's Black History Month, so happy Black History Month to everybody. And I always, because it's Black History Month, I also love to begin my presentation with what I call the African Ancestors Acknowledgement. So we acknowledge Africa, the birthplace of humanity, we remember and honor all our ancestors, those who built millennia old civilizations from Kemet to Monomotapa, from Takru to Kush. We also remember and honor the millions of Africa's children who were ripped from her bosom, kidnapped and stolen into the great Maafa or slave trade. This debased Africa and robbed her of her greatest wealth, her people. Yet Africa ascends and ascends and this presentation is in honor of her. And so it's, um, it, it really ties in the ancestors' acknowledgement with my talk um, tonight, because Thomas Peters was one of those people, one of those uh, children who 
you know, suffer the indignity and the humiliation and the grief of being kidnapped into the transatlantic slave trade. And the, the entire collectivity actually of the black loyalist um, who will provide the context for this talk. Thomas Peters fled slavery to freedom and fought on the side of the British during the American Revolutionary War. As a result, he earned the status of black loyalist. And in 1784, at the end of the war, was transported to Nova Scotia. The British promised land, tools, provisions, and full equality with whites for all the black loyalists. But in Nova Scotia and later New Brunswick, the British betrayed the promises they made and reduced the black loyalists to a state of deprivation, subjugation, and sometimes slavery. Outraged and disappointed, Thomas Peters took up the cause of his community and through a series of petitions called on the colonial governments of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick to make good on the promises made by the Crown. When the colonial governors turned a deaf ear, Peters traveled to London, England, and plead the cause of the Black Loyalists to the imperial government. In London too, he wrote a series of petitions outlining the grievance of his community and revealing the various manifestations of uh, colonial anti-Black racism. While in London, Peters was presented with the opportunity for the Black Loyalists to migrate to Sierra Leone and start a new colony on the West African coast. He traveled to Canada, organized exodus from Nova Scotia and New Brunswick to Sierra Leone. The presentation addresses the use of the petition as an advocacy tool for social, racial, and political change. The activism of Peters, colonial duplicity and racism, and the unending quest for dignity um, black people is, by Black people is also addressed. The presentation also touches on a Black Atlantic identity through literacy. I will focus on Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and the London years, as these are the best documented period of um, Thomas Peters's life. I want to say a, a word about the petition. The petition was an 18th and 19th century tool. I don't know if we use it so much in the 20th century. I, I, no, actually, I take that back because there are all these various online petitions. But in the 18th and 19th century world, it was used um, by various groups, by everyone, to publicize and ear a grievance, bring, bring a perceived atrocity to public attention, and in so doing, bring some form of restitution to the aggrieved party. There were new thousands of anti-slavery petitions as the anti-slavery um, campaign you know, got really animated in the last quarter of the 18th century, thousands of petitions signed by th literally thousands of people um, ended up, you know, on, in, in the British Parliament, in the, in the American Congress, um, in the Canadian or colonial, various colonial um, legislatures all over the world. People use these petitions to um, bring to the public um, the atrocities uh, that, that were committed in slavery against the Black people's bodies. Um, in our federal parliament today, we know petitions are presented uh, regularly to hear such um, grievances. Um, so Peters was drawing on a tried and true method that was very much in vogue at the time. Peters is known in various roles and by several identities. We learned that he was a Yoruba prince from the Egba subclan in Nigeria, he, an enslaved man is in Louisiana and North Carolina, a runaway slave, a soldier in the Black Pioneers military unit that fought on the side of the British during the American Revolutionary War, a Black loyalist in Nova Scotia, a Black power leader and civil rights activist in the maritime provinces, a husband and a father, a proponent of African emigration, 
an immigrant on one of the 15 ships that sailed from Nova Scotia in January 1792, an advocate for black rights in Sierra Leone, and finally, one of the founding fathers of Sierra Leone. So at this moment, I will share my screen. I did um, create a presentation. If you just bear with me. I'm going to begin with um, Peter's looking, holding in his hand. This is a statue that is in Freetown, in downtown Freetown, Sierra Leone, right by this, the site um, where the, law, the Black Loyalists arrived from Canada in March 1793. And, you know, he's holding this document in, in his hand. Talk about the American Revolutionary War between the 13 colonies and mother country, Britain. And it was in this context that um, Thomas Peters entered history. In the 54 years that Peters lived, he did so on three continents, spent at least half of it in slavery, made up to four transatlantic crossings, the last three in service to black freedom, and died fighting a white power structure in Sierra Leone that was bent on denying black people their liberty and denying black people power. And, and so I talked about the revolution <coughs> quickly. Um, in 1775, the, the colonies, the British 13 colonies revolted against mother country Britain. Um, uh, both sides, you know, drew up their army. The war started royal governor of, uh, the royal governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore issued a proclamation in November of 1775 calling on um, basically enslaved African-Americans to run to the British standard. And if they did and were successful, they would be free. That was, uh, that was anathema. It, it was considered an atrocity by the American rebels or patriots. And, but thousands of people, took up uh, uh, Dunmore's, um, responded rather to Dunmore's pro proclamation. And Peters was one of them. In, in 1776, he appeared, um, Peters, he was enslaved in North Carolina in the Cape Fear, Cape Fear area. And he, um, in the spring of 1776, he joined General Clinton um, who had ships stationed in the Cape Fear, up on the, the Cape Fear River. And um, Clinton, what he did, so Dunmore made his proclamation in 1775. Um, Clinton expanded that proclamation. Whereas Dunmore wanted strong, able-bodied men, um, and you know, runaway uh, slaves men, Clinton said, well, basically everybody, men, women, children, old people, uh, flee your rebel masters and come to us. You will be welcome. You'll gain your freedom, fight for us, work for us. And thousands of people responded to that. And as I said, including Peters. So um, Clinton formed a corps, it was a provincial corps called the Black Pioneers. And um, Peters was a member of that corps. He rose to the rank of sergeant. The Black Pioneers fought with Clinton over the duration of the war in North Carolina, Philadelphia, Rhode Island, New York City, and they were at the siege of Carleton. Very important uh, siege, because that was where Thomas Peters met his, uh, the woman who became his wife, Sally. Like Peters, with the promise of freedom ringing in their ears, thousands of enslaved uh, people eventually joined and fought for the British cause. Those Americans who served and remained loyal to the British were called loyalists. Those who were enslaved and black were just called black loyalists. Thus this identity was forged in war. It must be noted that it was not Dunmore, it was neither Dunmore nor Clinton or any of the British generals who freed these enslaved blacks. The black people were the ones who freed themselves. Like Peters and thousands of others, they fled from their masters. If they were caught, they could be killed, maimed, imprisoned. So they were the ones who waded through swamps, who walked for miles 
to a, a British ship or to a British port. So this whole idea of the British granting them freedom, in, in many ways it was theoretical because they themselves had to be in a place where they could actually claim that freedom. So after seven years of fighting, the, um, the war ended with a British loss an American victory. The British, the British thought they had been the war, they had the mightiest army, um, and but that didn't happen. The Americans won the war with the help of the French government, of course. Nonetheless, the Americans won the war and the British must now make good on their promise to the thousands of Black loyalists who had supported them. Unfortunately, they returned thousands of these people back to their slave owners who in places like New York and Savannah, um, Georgia, uh, uh, when the treaty was signed, there was a clause that was inserted in the treaty that says, you know, the Americans must get back their slaves if they had served with the British for less than a year. It was awful. So thousands, of, in fact, the majority of people who had fled to the British side were returned to their owners. Those who could show um, that they had served for a year or more were given a certificate of freedom at um, New York, New York Harbor, um, St. Augustine, Georgia, uh, St. Augustine, Florida, rather, Savannah, Georgia, so on and so forth. They were given the certificate of freedom to show that they had served with the British for a number of years and they were free to go. And here is a copy of uh, Thomas Peters's um, certificate of freedom signed in New York Harbor, 26 October, 1783. These, um, these are to certify that the bearer hereof Sergeant Thomas Peters of the Black Pioneer Corps has served his majesty since the year 1776, sworn before Alderman Waddell of the city by the order of Sir Henry Clinton, and during which time he has served faithfully and honestly. This, this was his certificate of freedom. Um, it was such an important document. And so as the British uh, were about to transport upwards of 3,000 people from New York port to the maritime provinces, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, they, they had this document, this military register called the Book of Negroes, in which they inscribed the name of every single person that was to go on those ships. Peters was one of them. His, his wife, Sally Peters, was one of them. They had their certificate. The, the children, Clara, who was about 12 years old at the time, and baby John, I'm not sure if they got a certificate, but they were recorded, their names were recorded in Book of Negroes. And baby John was 18 months old, and he was born behind British lines, um, according to the Book of Negroes. So they all sailed um 3000 people you know i just want people to imagine that you know over the course of 3 4 months thousands and thousands of people sailed from new york's um, port we know upwards of 3000 went to the maritime provinces but black loyalists also went to jamaica um some went to the uk um some went to germany um cassandra pibus is uh, who's an australian author uh, documents um the presence of black loyalists in australia so this black loyalism was a global phenomenon but i'm here to speak about the ones who came to the maritime provinces they also came to upper canada and lower canada by the way so peters is recorded in the book of negroes um, he sails out from New York Harbor in November of 1784. It was 1783. It was the end of the hurricane season. As soon as they launched into Atl the Atlantic, they encountered the hurricane and they had to sail the ship called the Joseph. They had to sail to Bermuda. They spent the winter in Bermuda. And in May of 1784, the following year, same ship, um, a repaired refuel sailed to Annapolis Royal in Nova Scotia and this was in May and Peter and his family and uh, many uh, of the men who served in the Black Pioneer and their families 
um, also landed with Peter. So th this was a community. It, it wasn't a, a ship full of strangers. Many of them had fought together in the pioneer, in the Black Pioneers and Guides. They had been at New York at the end of the war when uh, you know, Britain gave up and they had traveled together. They went to Bermuda together. And now here they are in Nova Scotia um, together. Murphy Steele, who was also a sergeant, um, the wife of Murphy Steele, they all landed in Anna Place Royale. So this is May of 1784. By August of 1784, we have what must be the first, if not one of the first petitions from Thomas Peters. Um, and so it's just a few months. And he says, you know, he, he talks about his, his, um, his enrollment in the guide, in the Black Guides and Pioneers, the humble petition, of the Black Pioneers. And he sent this to Governor Parr of Nova Scotia. I'm just showing here an image of the actual document, but I don't expect you to read it. And he states, we first enlisted in the year 1776 and was promised when we were sworn in by order of Sir Henry Clinton to serve faithfully and truly during the American rebellion, which when it, when it was over, um, we were to be at our own liberty. We will be very much obliged to your excellency if you would be so good as to grant the articles allowed by the government to us as the rest of the disbanded soldiers of his majesty's army, land and provisions, the same <clears throat> as the rest of the disbanded soldiers, but we have not yet received. This as the rest of the disbanded soldiers, Peters is talking about the white soldiers. They got the land, they got the provisions, they got the tools. And um, imagine he just came three months, he, he hasn't received it. The people who had arrived the previous year haven't received it. So it was the, the, the in, in many of these communities, for example, in the Birchall community, Birchdown, people were reduced to a state of starvation. In Digby, in the Digby area where Peters ended up for a while, um, the loyalists, the black loyalists were given the provision but only for three months and they had to perform road work to do it. They were landless. Um, first of all, most of the Black Loyalists did not receive the land that the British had promised at New York. Um, even after, even when they were leaving in 1792, the majority still had not received it in any land. The majority hadn't received rations. As I mentioned, the Digby folks in the Bay of Fundy area only got three, three months worth of ration. Rations were needed to stave off hunger and starvation. Um, the, when, when you think, why would want, why would people want to acquire a land to have a farm? It is so that they could have their independence. Within Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, the colonial authorities on the ground did not want that to happen. Simply put, they wanted the Black lawyers to, re, to remain a reserve army of labor, a pool of labor from which they could draw on whenever they wanted that labor to perform road work, to work as sheer croppers on farms. Um, the, the black people also lived in segregated communities, um, close enough to the white communities. So when they wanted, you know, laborers, they could, they don't have to travel too far to get laborers, but far enough so that the blacks were out of sight and um, they, didn't, uh, they, they didn't have to mix with them. So what happened with the arrival of the, the black, the white loyalists and the black loyalists, and also the enslaved Africans that the white loyalists owned, but that's another story. A new social and racial order was evolving in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick that assumed black inferiority and subordination and white superiority and hegemony. 
The maritime provinces and the Canadian colonies were being constructed as a white man's country in which whites dominated um, every sector of society and black marginalization became the norm. So simply put, the promises that were made at New York and even before New York with Lord Dunmore and Clinton, um, when the, uh, the, the black loyalists arrived, they, those promises were broken. And so we have in August 1784, uh, uh, Peters and Murphy Steele's petitioning. And they had every reason to do this because not only was the land not given, not only was the provisions not given, not only was the civil rights, they were promised they, they would be able to vote and serve on juries, schools and churches, all of those things were promised. Not only were those things not forthcoming, but the black community or communities and you, um, and began to be, be really abused by the local white community, physical abuse. So for example, in July, 1784, so Peters would have known of this, um, uh, the white community in Shelburne and Birchstone unleashed a one, what I called a one week fury of anti-black racism upon these communities white laborers and disbanded soldiers accusing the black loyalists of working for lower wages attacked the communities in Shelburne and Birchtown, tore down the houses of the people, beat them up and drove them out of town. David George, one of the, the black preachers in, in Birchtown, he, um, he writes about hiding in the woods, hiding in the swamps. They destroyed David uh, George's church and um, you know, and, and he, he was able to eventually pull himself together, pull his, and pull his congregation together. Um, in 1785, a year after the, the town of Shelburne instituted, um, uh, you know, cr created this bylaw that banned Negro frolics. So they, they banned black people from having parties, from engaging in any form of uh, public entertainment. So there was a bylaw that banned black people from enjoying themselves. So these were some of the hardships that the black loyalists were subjected to at the time. And so when you couple that with the lack of land, the lack of employment opportunities, you see why Peters and, and Steeles and others would begin to agitate. Now, a, a word on, on um, oh, there's the cases of Mary Postel and Lydia Jackson, these two women who were re-enslaved in Nova Scotia. Lydia Jackson was able to go to Sierra Leone. Her case is very, very tragic. We may be able to talk about that later. And Mary Postel and her children were re-enslaved in Nova Scotia. And one of the, the, the daughters were actually sold out of the province to the American South. And um, Pastel, she had her certificate of freedom, but she lost it. And um, her previous owner in South Carolina reclaimed her. So the, um, you know, Peter's petition, and she shared that first petition with you. Six years later, um, there's another petition here. We, the black people of the province of, of New Brunswick. So they sent this to the governor and they had this publicized, the governor of New Brunswick, talking about two provinces, we'll get to why, um, was uh, Thomas Carlton. And so the people in that area, the Bay of Fundy area, they decided that, you know what, we really, have to get together Pete, people like Peters and Steels are working for us and we are going to inform the world we're going to inform the province that we are we we um, appoint nominate and appoint Thomas Peters to be our attorney for the purposes aforesaid for religious and civil matters they call it the attorney the representative Peters as I mentioned was a sergeant in the Black Pioneers he already had a leadership role during the revolution and he, 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 he continues to bear that responsibility when he arrives in Nova Scotia. And here his, um, 
his, his colleagues, his cohort, members of the, the community made this public. We have appointed Thomas Peters to be our um, representative to government officials, to religious officials, and so on. Um, this continued the, 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 the petitioning, the going back and forth. In fact, Thomas Peters, no, he leaves Nova Scotia. He leaves Nova Scotia when he, he couldn't get land. He crosses the Bay of Fundy um, into New Brunswick, takes a ferry. He goes into New Brunswick, St. John, New Brunswick. And because he heard that things were better in New Brunswick, there were more opportunities there, work opportunities. Remember, he's a millwright. During slavery, he was a millwright. Um, and he could get land. It was this endless search for land. He arrives in New Brunswick, but that was that was not the case. Um, the Black people were just as disenfranchised as in Nova Scotia. In fact, after that first petition that he and he and um, Thomas uh, Murphy Steele wrote, the government responded by granting the the Black loyalists of Digby one acre lots. So the, the governor sent the surveyor, they carved out these one acre lots, one acre to give to the people of Digby, including Thomas Peters, but they could not take up, they could not take up that land. They could not occupy the land because the whites in Digby and the Brindley town area claimed those one acre lots. So imagine the government said, we are, um, we, we are surveying these, these lots for you. And then the white community said, no, those are our lots. They can't take it. At that point, Peters leaves and he goes over to New Brunswick. Just a word here on, on um, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. The whole area was called Nova Scotia um, at the end of the American Revolutionary War. But in 1784, the, the imperial government decided to uh, divide the province of Nova Scotia. So New Brunswick was carved out of Nova Scotia. So uh, Peters goes over to New, New Brunswick. He's in St. John. He's in um, Fredericton. The, it, it's like, um, it, it's, um, it's this search, this search that for land, for citizenship, um, for dignity that was not forthcoming. So in March, here's another petition to His Excellency Thomas Carlton, the memorial of Thomas Peters, humbly sheweth that the lot on which your memorial list at present lives is too small for the support of his family. He therefore prays that your Excellency will be pleased to grant him the land and he names where um, he knows this land is. In fact, it was an area that Peters and his cohort had identified uh, a, a big uh, plot of land that they had identified that would be suitable for them. This 18th March, um, it wasn't forthcoming. So what did, what did they do? What did Thomas Peters do? What did the, the Black loyalists of the Annapolis Valley region and of New Brunswick across the Bay of Fundy, what did they do? They decided after seven years of, you know, pleading, literally pleading to both colonial governments to treat them as human beings. And, um, you know, those pleas were fell on deaf ears uh, they decided to send Thomas Peters to London. They perhaps raised the 17 pounds for his, the travel, the, the ship's travel. Um, but he left New Brunswick, came to Halifax, went on a ship, crossed the ocean to England to plead the cause of the Black Loyalist to, to the king. In England, he, um, he was wine and dine. We don't know if that's really an image of Thomas Peters there in, you know, long African robes with a, with a turban. But we know that he met some of the leading lights in the abolitionist movement. He met Granville Sharp. He was um, introduced to his old um, general, Hen Henry Clinton, who 
introduced him between Granville Sharp and Clinton. Um, Peters was introduced to Lord Grenville, the Secretary of State. We know he was feted. Um, he also met members of the Black community, uh, people like uh, Olado Equiano. And he was able to present two petitions to the um, to Lord Lord Grenville, who was the Secretary of State. So it's it's interesting. This is sort of an important sidebar. I talked about it in the paper. The whole question of literacy. Could Thomas Peters read and write? Um, I say yes. I say yes. On some of the petitions, he and Murphy Steele, like the one with he and Murphy Steele, the first petition, he's, they signed their names. In another petition to the first petition to the British government, <clears throat> sorry, he signed an X. There are some other letters and petitions in which um, there's an X and there's one which, in which his name is signed. Um, people were literate, there were people who were literate, uh, uh, you know, coming from the, the slavery, coming from a situation where you're not taught to read and write. In fact, it was a crime if you, if you, uh, if it was believed that you knew how to read and write. But I think Thomas Peters was, um, had semi-literacy, um, could read, perhaps could read better than he could write. But I won't belabor that point. Like I said, it's it's for another it's for another um, discussion. But it's interesting because <clears throat> in London he presents this um, petition to to the Secretary of State. It's very polished, very uh, very polished petition, and um, it was really really a, a powerful petition. And I'll just I'll just read it because. I think it's important um, that, that, that you all hear the, the words of this man. And the original is in the British archives, but I'm reading um, a transcribed, transcribed copy here from um, Harvey uh, Emanuel Whitfield's book, Black Slavery in the Maritimes. And he's actually um, out there in, He's at UC, University of Calgary. The humble petition of Thomas Peters, a Negro late sergeant in the regiment of guides um, in the late war under the command of General Henry Clinton, now deputed by his fellow soldiers and other free, free Negroes and people of color settled at Annapolis, Digby and St. John, New Brunswick. Your memorially shows that the situation of the free Negroes and people of color above mentioned is rendered extremely irksome and disadvantageous, not only by the want of the promised allotment of land, which they cannot yet obtain. Though seven years have elapsed since the arrival in the province appointed for their settlement, but more specifically, they are injured by a public and avowed toleration of slavery in Nova Scotia, as if the happy influence of his majesty's free government was incapable of being extended so far as America, America just means North America, to maintain justice and right in affording the protection of the law and the constitution of England. Very, very strong, very, very strong. And he goes on to, to say that I cannot believe it is really the intention of the British government to favor injustice or tolerate slavery in Nova Scotia. So he comes out, you know, he comes out punching. He's punching with both hands. He's, he's, he's no longer shy. Um, he never was shy. But th this kind of you know, tame language that we see when he was writing to Governor Parr or Governor Carlton, it's all gone. Here he's really punching hard in London. And think of it, it's been um, 
six, seven years of agitation. They haven't gotten the, 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 um, the land. There, many of them are landless. Many of them have done well. Many of the black loyalists, you know, people like, you know, Harry Washington, Isaac Anderson, they had pursued their trade. But by and large, the vast majority of these people um, did not receive the, 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 the um, the, the, the land, the provisions, the schools, everything that was promised. And so you may be wondering, well, you know, um, after six years, you know, why didn't they help themselves? Of course they did. They were the ones who were responsible for their own survival. But think of it, the white community, the, law, the white loyalists who had fought um, and many of them didn't even fight for the British during the war, but anyway, they supported the British. When they came in, they were provided with, 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 with the tools, um, the land, they were also given the opportunities. Many of them got jobs in, you know, to work in various capacities and so on. The black people did not. So that's the point we want, um, we want I, I want you to, to bear in mind. Thomas Peters in this petition, the, the two petitions to Granville, he states his status. He was free, not enslaved. He served the British during the war. He attained the rank of surgeon. He boldly states um, he, that, you know, in this petition to Granville that it was not, he's presented not only on behalf of himself, but also on behalf of the black loyalists in the two communities. In delineating his identities, these identities, Thomas Peters revealed himself to be a man of purpose and a man of intention. This is a, a, a painting, a portrait of Olado Equiano, the celebrated um, Nigerian abolitionist who, who wrote his famous narrative and who was living in London at the time. And we are sure that he met up with Thomas Peters when Peters was in London. Peters was in London for 10 months, by the way. So, Peters now, he now meets with officials of the Sierra Leone Company. The Sierra Leone Company is this colonizing outfit that wants to establish a colony in Sierra Leone. They had early start um, in, in sending the so-called London poor to Freetown, Sierra Leone. That didn't work out too well, but they were looking now for more settlers to send to Sierra Leone. So Peters engaged in discussion with them, people like Granville Sharp, who was an officer in the Sierra Leone Company, and it was agreed on that the Black Loyalists in Canada or in Eastern Canada would go to Sierra Leone to, to settle there. The British government agreed to pay the way for the, lo the Black Loyalists in Canada to go to Sierra Leone. And you, one would have thought that the Sierra Leone company would have hired Thomas Peters to do the job of uh, going to Canada and organizing. But no, they chose the younger brother of um, Thomas Clarkson, John Clarkson, who was 27 years old, to go to Canada and to head up this ex this the impending exodus um they promised the would be um the settlers uh, 20 acres of land for a man 10 for his wife five for every child free settlement on the coast of africa uh, P, uh, they promised them full rights full equality political rights, commercial rights, religious rights. They would be, you know, a full uh, subjects of the crown. They would get the land in Sierra Leone. Peters heads back to Canada. He's very happy. Um, he begins to recruit and organize um, people in both Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Uh, John Clarkson is down in the Shelburne area and the Halifax area doing that. And so, by December 1791, we have um, cl close to 1,200 people, 1,196 um, people, men, women, and children gathered in, <clears throat> in Halifax, Nova Scotia, waiting to depart to West Africa. And this is the last letter we have of Thomas Peters in Canada, and he it's a letter he writes with another Black loyalist called David Edmonds. 
Edmonds, ED, MONS, or sometimes there's a D at the end too, in behalf of the Black people of Halifax. And he, um, it's a, uh, for me, it's very, it's very poignant because he writes to John Clarkson, who was in, 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 Nova in Halifax, this is December 23rd, so you know Christmas is coming. And he, he said, if it pleases your honor, could we have, you know, some more fresh beef? It's going to be our last Christmas. It is the last Christmas day that we, will, we shall ever see in America. And may it please your honor to grant us one day's allowance of fresh beef for a Christmas dinner. So it's a last supper of sorts that... Um, Peters will be will be hosting for the the would be immigrants. John Clarkson grants grants this request, and they 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 had their last supper in Canada. This isn't not the Black Loyalist <laughs> in in Halifax. It's an image of the Emancipados at Plymouth. Before these Canadian loyalists left in 1792. The, I, I mentioned the London poor, the black poor that had gone earlier to Sierra Leone to establish a settlement. The London poor were also black loyalists, but that's another story. But in around 17, 1788, many of the so-called London poor left from different ports in the UK uh, for Sierra Leone. But I put it here because it shows them in a jubilant mood. And I think in... Um, in Halifax, they also were in a, ju a, a jubilant mood. But what a feat it was for Thomas Peters to actually go to London, got the ear of the Secretary of State, got the ear of important men in the in the government, and and who said yes, you know, th this is an atrocity. That's what has happened to the Black Loyalists in Nova Scotia, um, Grenville. It, by the time Peters. Uh, returns to Nova Scotia and begins to organize the exodus. Dundas is now Secretary of State. Dundas writes to both governors of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. And he said, you know, this is terrible. This is an atrocity. How could you have treated these people this way? We, we had promised them, um, you know, all these things. And for seven years, they haven't received it. They have a cause for concern. They're going to Sierra Leone. We will pay, um, we will pay, we will get the ships. We'll pay for everything. And I want you to begin an investigation as to why the Black Loyalists were not given what was promised them. So the two colonial governments were very upset um, with Peters. When Peters arrives from England to London, to Halifax, Governor Parr refused to talk to him. Nonetheless, he made his way to New Brunswick and began organizing um, the, the, the people. And so in January 15, 1792, 230 years ago, it's a, a month we celebrated the 230th anniversary. The, you know, close to 1200 people left Halifax Harbor, um, left Canada and sailed to Sierra Leone. Thomas Peters himself led about 94 uh, persons from the Annapolis Valley region to, to Halifax, where they embarked on the ship. And while he was coming through the Wolfville area, he was attacked by white people who was mad that he was taking all these people out of the country to West Africa. This is an image of a, a poem I did, a video poem called 15 Ships, in which I talked about the 15 ships, this flotilla of ships that sailed to West Africa. And so in March 1792, the, the 15 ships arrived in Freetown, Sierra Leone. And, and they began a new life, which I, I may talk about. If you ask me a question at the end, I may talk about the Sierra Leone <clears throat> experience. It didn't go off, it didn't start off too well. Again, the British promised the people, but this time they said, we're not going, you know, we're not going anywhere. We're not going back on any ships. We're, we're going to stay here and we're going to fight for our rights. We're going to get what was promised to us in London and at Halifax. The, um, eventually it worked out. Eventually it worked out. 
Thomas Peters dies shortly after he, um, the arrival of the ships in Sierra Leone. He, he died on June 26, 1792. By then, by time of his death, he and John Clarkson were not speaking to each other. In fact, there was almost like open rebellion against John Clarkson, who was installed as governor of the, of the province of this uh, province of freedom was what they called Sierra Leone. Nonetheless, like I said, it, it did work out. It did work out for the black loyalists, but Peters himself did not live to see that. In 1793, some of his colleagues crossed the ocean, went to London again to plead their cause because the Sierra Leone Company had become dictatorial and autocratic. In 1794, there was a rebellion against the, the, the company. In 1800, further rebellion against the Sierra Leone Company. It was eventually, um, Sierra Leone was eventually turned into a crown colony. The fact of Peters having been born free and living as a free person in West Africa in his formative years undoubtedly had an impact on his consciousness in slavery. He arrived in the Americas with, armed with an African conception of freedom. Though he endured enslavement, like many black loyalists who risked their lives to gain freedom, Peters had shaken off the shackles of mental slavery. His life in the colonies as a slave and a soldier and his subsequent career as a black loyalist showed that Peters had developed had well-developed ideas about justice, liberty, um, community building, and Black capacity. The using the petition or the, the, the petition as a tool symbol was a sign of subjecthood. It was also a sign of citizenship and freedom, that one was free. It was a free person who could petition whomever, those in authorities. 18th century Blacks, like Peters, used this, the tool of the petition to condemn and to challenge racism that his people endured and to seek, yes, to seek reparations. So I, I will end there. Thank you very much. Um, here is a, a, a clip from a petition called the Beaverhood Petition. Henry Beaverhood, who was one of the Black Loyalists, he presented its petition to the Sierra Leone Company the same day that Thomas Peter died, 26 June, 1792. And I wonder if Peters had a hand in crafting this petition before he died. We are all willing to be governed by the laws of England in full, and we do not see consent to give it to your honor without having any of our color in it. They're saying it's white men who are ruling this colony. We don't like that. We were um, given certain promises at London and, and Halifax. This is our country. This is Africa. They said we're Africans. We have a right to rule ourselves. So the petition, the letter, and black people took up, took up this tool at the end of the 18th century to articulate their vision of freedom, their conception of freedom, and to demand full rights as citizens. Um, Haitian Revolution. I'm going to end with this picture. You know, Thomas Peter is certainly one of my heroes. And in uh, June 2013, I went to Freetown, Sierra Leone, and I had to take this picture at the foot of the statue of Thomas Peters in downtown Freetown. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions and please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the top or bottom panel of your screen. We've got some questions already, Afwa, so I'll, I'll get to them. Um, the first one, uh, thank you so very much for this wonderful story, <clears throat> narrated with such passion, but also clarity, Dr. Cooper. I have two simple questions. First, could you say something about how Thomas Peter supported himself during all those years of agitation, which also involved a lot of travel? And second, could you say a few words about your title, The Power of the Pen? Thank you. So 
he supported himself. He was a millwright. And I imagine he supported himself as a millwright uh, and as a sawyer and, um, and, and doing whatever he could. We, we know, for example, like someone like Harry Washington, who was a sawyer, supported himself as a sawyer. We know that. So I assume Peters did. Peters was a community leader and a community developer. And even in, in going to, to London, you know, we asked ourselves, how did he pay? 17 pounds is a lot of money. That was what it cost. But um, we're thinking that the communities on both sides of the funding helped him to raise that, that fear, or he himself did. But that's how I believe he supported himself. The power of the pen. Black people realized, I mean, uh, Olado Equiano, he, he wrote his narrative, right? The interesting narrative of Gustavo Lassa. And there are several other end of the 18th century black writers who, who knew the power of the pen and who drew on that power in articulating not just their, their vision of humanity and um, but, but their books were also a, a, a plea. Their books were also a plea to anti-slavery. Well, their books were anti-slavery documents, right? So they knew the power of the pen. It's the end of the 18th century, people are really getting literate. Newspapers are flourishing and, and people understood the power of the written word. So that's why I had that title. Thanks a lot, Afwa. Uh, another question. Um, a lot has been written about the black loyalists in Birchtown, Nova Scotia. Do you know if there's anyone who has researched and written about the history of the Black Loyalists in the Cumberland area? Um, in the Cumberland area, no, I'm, I, I, I don't know. There's a, there's a student at the University of New Brunswick by the name of Graham Nickerson, who is looking at Black Loyalism in, in both in both provinces. I'll speak to him and I'll ask him, you know, um, Carmelita Robertson has looked at the Black Loyalists in, in the Tracadie region in, in Guysborough County. A lot has been written on, you know, Birchtown, not so much on, on you know, the Digby area where, where Peters was, but uh, there's a new, there's a document called Mapping Annapolis, which looks at the Black Loyalist experience through visual mapping in, in an, an Annapolis Royale. But, and also a, a lot is happening now in New Brunswick, but I'm not, I don't know about the Cumberland area. But you may look at, you know, some of the authority, the authoritative documents or books on the Black Loyalists like James Walker's The Black Loyalist and Ellen Gibson Wilson, The Loyal Blacks. They, you know, they kind of look at the whole entire thing, you know, London, Canada. So I'm sure there's something there on all of the, the settlements. Thank you. Um, another, qu another question. Um, wonderfully informative talk as usual, Afua. Can you say more about the rebellions of those returned Africans against the Sierra Leone company? What were the issues involved? I ask as a Creole, Handel Kashobe, right? Readily recognized in Sierra Leone by our white last names as a descendant of one or more of those various groups or returnees. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Thank you, Handel, for your question. Um, Yes, I mean, I ended with the Beaverhood petition <laughs> and, and, and Henry Beaverhood who actually was a West Indian from the Danish, the Danish, um, the Danish islands, which became the US Virgin Islands. And in fact, Henry Beaverhood was free. He was not an escaped slave, but he, anyway, he fought with the British. And I ended with that because, you know, it's very like in it, Henry Beaverhood is kicking us. He said, we do not want anything but that which is fair and honest, which was concluded upon in Halifax that we should assist in public matters, you know? And so no, no, no fear. This is 1792. This is a few months after they arrived in Sierra Leone when the Sierra Leone company um, reneged on every promise that was made in London, right? Um, when John Clarkson became this autocrat, this dictator, and um, 
and 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 there were whites in Sierra Leone, and and they gave the whites the choice the choice waterfront lots. <laughs> the black people had no lots carved out, surveyed for them. So by 1794, there's they are in open rebellion. Oh, and the Sierra Leone Company didn't want them to become farmers and plant their own food because the company had a store and the company said, you can buy provisions from our store and you may not have any money, but you can take it on credit. So you see what's, what's happening there. And of course the Nova Scotians as they came to be called said, hell no, this is not happening. So in 1794, open rebellion, 1800 open rebellion, like open rebellion, people with knives and guns and machetes and they're gonna attack the government, um, the govern governor's mansion. And then you know what happened. The Maroons arrived from Nova Scotia and put down that rebellion. Ah, oh, that's so terrible, divide and rule. Um, so Handel, that's what happened. But many of these people had arrived from North America with those names already. Thomas Peters, what's his Yoruba name? We don't know. He has descendants in Freetown. So, you know, Henry Beaverhood, I, I, you know, Beaverhood, that's like a Dutch, uh, German, Danish name, right? So the, the names were already there by 1792, by 1783, when they left New York port. Those were the names that were inscribed in the Book of Negros. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Cooper for your talk and for your generous answers to the questions, very full. Um, I'm sorry, but this concludes our, our question period. Um, it would have been wonderful if we could continue a bit longer. Um, thanks to everyone for participating. So just to answer that quick question, yes, I do, I do agree that uh, Thomas Peters deserve a monument in the maritime provinces. That was from Adrian Labour. And it was my great pleasure. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. Okay, so thank you so much, Shelley, for being our moderator tonight. I'd also, of course, like to thank you, Dr. Cooper, for joining us and for sharing your expertise and insights with us this evening. So very grateful for that. And so I would like to remind everybody that there's another Black History Month event, uh, Tenderness with Titi Lopez on Uga. Uh, that event was to begin at 7 p.m. Uh, so to learn more and register for this event, please visit the link pasted into the chat. And that concludes our presentation tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for Dr. making James. the time to join us tonight. Dr. James. Hi, go ahead, Afwa. Yeah, can I say one thing? There are, For whole sure, bunch yeah. there are a whole bunch of people asking me questions. You can send me your questions at my uh, Dalhousie address, afua.cooper at dal.ca, and I will answer them. Okay, then, yeah, hopefully you got that email for Dr. Cooper. So again, thank you so much and good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now.